Hey everyone, I hope all is well in your corner of the world. It's been a while since I've done an actual pre-recorded video that isn't a live stream. And I'm really excited about this because I'm going to do a dramatic reading from my upcoming book. The fourth book in the Warriors of Brea series, which is The Hidden Goddess. It's coming out this Saturday, <laughs> which is coming up really quick and it's amazing. Um, but I was super excited to do this because I just received the proof copy to make sure everything looks good. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I think this cover is gorgeous and just simply amazing. It's done by Kiaru, who is an amazing and talented artist. I have so much respect for him and, his, and just admiration for his ability. Um, and I'm so thankful that he is willing to do covers for me. So yeah, be sure to check it out on October 22nd is when the book is coming out. And in the meantime, I wanted to do a dramatic reading from this book just to kind of, well, for one thing, I get to practice my narration. And then another thing, um, hopefully that'll help you feel excited for when this book comes out. Um, just a caveat, I have a cold this week and I didn't think I would be able to do this, but my voice doesn't, it doesn't feel, it doesn't, my throat isn't so sore anymore and um I think I still have a little bit of congestion but I think I sound good enough <laughs> hopefully you agree um at the very least perhaps my deeper voices will be more convincing um but let's go ahead and dive into it uh if you haven't read the third book you will be very confused and I highly recommend you read the third book before listening to this um Otherwise, this is definitely going to be spoilers for this book um, and things that happen at the end of the third book. So, yeah, take that as you will. Um, where we left off last time, and the part I'm going to read, is Vaden and his friends came upon Taren, and there's a very serious problem happening in Taren um, that he wasn't expecting or wasn't expecting to that degree. So this chapter is just kind of getting back, like him trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And I hope you enjoy. So here is a chapter from The Warriors of Brea, The Hidden Goddess. Footsteps pounded behind Vaden. Amuesh's voices broke the terrible silence. So this is the great city. Oh, no. Something is very wrong, he heard Lady Anne say. Somewhere in the depths of his scattered mind arose the comment, always stating the obvious. But he could not bring himself to speak. Just a few desai away, the Deserta Suskem burned. I feared something like this would happen, Ganeth said from within. And Ganeth didn't warn him? What good would warning you do? You've shown many times that revealing distressing information leads you to do something rash, something dangerous. You knew something bad had happened, and the picture is becoming more clear. Now we must determine the nature of this situation. Vaden agreed. He needed to pull himself together, to form a plan. They needed information, and that was something Vaden was very good at getting. But right now, all he could do was stare at the smoking palace. No one said anything for several long moments. Someone knelt down beside him. A hand rested on his shoulder. I'm sorry, said Lady Anne said softly, gently. My greatest fear has been seeing Sumba in ashes, and I cannot imagine what this is like for you. That spurred something within Vaden, shaking him out of his stupor. He glanced at her, unable to smile, but grateful all the same. The Algarin contingent caught up with them, their wary eyes on the smoky palace. When they approached, Vaden stood. This is your city. What will we do about this? Tarif asked in Aroa, cutting straight to the point. Vaden took a breath taming the worries and desperation that sought to flood him. We must first find out what happened. We must lie low and not call attention to ourselves. I will lead a small team to the city to gather information. 
With a slight sinking feeling, he looked around at the group, noticing just how much Algarans, Amnasi, and a Katal would stand out in the Brayan city. Regardless, a plan started to form. We will enter the city as mercenaries hearing about trouble in the Brayan palace. I'll say we are looking for employ with the queen or her enemies. Whoever pays more. He looked at the Amnasi and repeated the plan in Corvette. To Am, he said, You are good at moving around undetected. You'll come with me. If Am Yuesh goes, I go, Lady Anne said. I can't say I didn't expect that. Yes, you can certainly pull off the mercenary look, so you will come too. He returned his attention to the Algarans and asked in Aroa, Does anyone volunteer? Saiboff stepped forward. I will come. Luf also stepped forward. I go with my sister. Vaden strongly wanted to say no, and he almost did. But he had to admit that Luf would make a convincing mercenary with his height and intimidating glare. But would he be more trouble than he was worth? He supposed he would rather find out now than in the heat of battle. Fine, he said at last. You will both come. Dress in full armor and with a hooded cloak. We don't want to draw too much attention. We will start out at sunset. When the Algarans left, Vaden updated the Amnasi and ensured, ensured Cheram would be all right staying back. I don't mind staying out of danger, as long as I can, at least, Cheram told him. Next, Vaden went to Azawal, who had taken up his usual position hanging back from the others. You do not have to stay with us if you do not want to, Vaden assured him yet again. Azawal looked up from of the faraway stare he had so frequently now. I have said before, I am a lost man. I have no home now. Vaden grimaced, feeling all too responsible for Azawal's predicament. Well, if you need anything, tell me, please. The Katal's man's uh, the Katal man's eyes lowered to back to the ground, heavy with sadness. I need time. To think of what I will do. My excursion into Tern will give you some time, if all goes well. And, if you know anything about what we're getting into, now would be the time to tell me. Still looking down, Azawal's jaw tightened. You know I cannot tell you the secrets of the Demuska. Secrets won't matter if we're all dead. Silence settled between them. Vaden waited, hoping Azawal would change his mind. If the Demuska exiled him, if the Demuska exiled him, why be loyal to them still? I will say this, Azawal said at last, his voice hushed, as if unsure whether even this was too much. The first ones are nothing to be trifled with. They command all the powers you Junta have and more. It wasn't exactly new information, but it at least reminded Vaden how carefully he would need to tread. Thank you, Azawal. <laughs> a little while later, Vaden strapped his sword to his back as he watched the sun dip low toward the horizon. He turned back toward Tern, clenching his jaw. Had his mother escaped? His sister? Would any allies be near? Lairdy Anne and Am joined him in staring at the city. It is magnificent, even now, Am said, his voice hushed. I hope to see it at its full glory soon. We will, Vaden said, more to assure himself than anyone else. Let's go. They summoned Saiboff and Luf, left their camp, and proceeded down the road toward the eastern gate. As they got closer... Vaden started to hear the sounds of horses whinnying and people calling out, but it was wrong. He knew this city. Its air was familiar in his lungs, the sounds as natural as his own voice. Now it was quieter, tense, discordant with everything he knew from before. At the gate, they were stopped. Vaden tried to remain calm, even though he had never been stopped at the gate before. 
What is your business here? The guard asked. We sell our protection. This place looks like it could use it, Val said, or excuse me, Vaden said, adjusting his accent to sound like he was from farther south. He had let his beard grow out again as well, concealing most of his tattoo. Hopefully, this would be enough to avoid notice. Protection, eh? The guard repeated, raising a scruffy eyebrow. He motioned to the others. And these foreigners? They're with me, Vaden said, adding a subtle warning to his voice. He had to tread the line between polite and arrogant. The right balance would give his disguise believability. The guard glanced at Vaden's swords. If you want to enter the city, you must relinquish your weapons. Why? Why do you think? The guard thrust a hand behind him toward the looming Deserasu skim. Vaden stared him down. We can't protect anyone if we don't have our weapons. The city can't protect much either by the look of it. Those are the Chancellor's orders. No weapons coming into the city. Now, are you going to waste my time some more or hand them over? Jo uh, Vaden chewed the inside of his cheek, deliberating. We'll leave. He waved to the others to follow. Let's go. We'll find better work in Akrama, anyway. And he strode away from the gate. Larry Ann waited until they were out of earshot before asking, Why did you give up so easily? Vaden sighed. I suspected this would be the case, not allowing weapons to come through the gates. That was a show to get information. Information? They hardly said anything. Actually, he told us quite a bit. The most important of which is that my mother is not in power. He said the Chancellor gave the order, not the Queen. Am um, and Lady Anne looked at him uneasily. No Queen? Saiboth asked in Corvette, her face also subtly betraying disquiet. What we need to do now is get into the city to find out why the Chancellor is giving orders, and why they have the city under tight wraps. Vaden continued, re relaying first in Corvette, then Oroa. That sounds reasonable, Larry Ann said. So how will we get in? Am um asked. Vaden smirked. That's the easy part. Murky water splashed up over Vaden's boots, the sound echoing eerily in the cramped tunnel. When you said you would get us in, you didn't say it would smell so bad, Am um, grumbled under his breath. Shall I lay a carpet out for you? Or perhaps a palanquin, Semrawan? Vaden replied. Do you want in the city without a fight or not? Am um, flashed a grin at him. All I'm saying is, the city looks grand, but could use a good sea breeze to clear out the air. A particularly loud squelch came from behind Vaden followed by, Sun Spirit burn this place. The deep voice rumbled through the tunnel, and Vaden briefly made eye contact with Luf. Suddenly frowning, he turned around, continuing the journey through the slimy, disgusting water. The sewers had always been his secret way in or out of the city. They were not all that secret, for any spy master worth his portia would have people stationed here to keep an eye out for infiltrators, but no one occupied this tunnel thus far. He wondered what had happened to the people he commanded in his own spy network. Had they returned to their homes, giving little thought to what happened to the second-born prince? Did they remain in the palace and were now fighting against whatever caused it to burn? Were they dead? He also what had happened to Atim Moita, the queen's actual spymaster, and whether he would have sta anyone stationed here farther along. Based on how vacant the tunnels were, he didn't have high hopes. Something had happened that most likely critically dismantled the structure of command. It might have been lucky for him at this moment, but his stomach sank low at how the pieces kept adding up towards something catastrophic happening in, happening in Terran. I suspect we will find out soon what exactly happened here. If it involves Astrin, she will not remain in the shadows for long. 
She will come out as soon as it, as it is advantageous. We won't know more until we get into the city proper. But to me, this is her coming out into the open. Vaden had suspected the same thing as a possibility among many. He quickened his pace, no longer caring about keeping his feet and clothes dry. By the time they got to the end of the sewer tunnel, the smell of rotting fish, dirty water, and who, know, and who knew what other waste was overpowering? Vaden's stomach roiled, and he scrunched his nose as he peered out of the tunnel entrance. It was night now, and no one seemed to be working the Veramar River's harbor this late. Carefully, he moved the grate blocking the sewers. This one had been unattached for as long as he could remember, an advantage for the Queen's spies to keep an eye on the underbelly of Tarn. He hoped it had not become yet another weak point the enemy took for its own advantage. Vaden listened for signs of people, of normal business, of life in the city as they crept up from the riverbed. He heard faint voices in buildings, heard the occasional scuff of a boot against the cobblestone. Too quiet. This place reeks of fear, Ganeth said. He peered over the top of the stairs, looking out for the guards. Until they found better disguises, they had to avoid guards at all costs or risk losing their weapons and being imprisoned. After a few katei of watching, he took note of two guards pacing up and down the harbor and sprang out with the others in tow when both were turned away. They rushed to the, gap to the alley by the tavern, using its shadows to conceal them. What's now? Lady Anne asked. Find some friends, or at least people who won't attack us, Vaden replied. It's so quiet, Saibov said, not like last time I was here. Come on, Val told the others after a moment of thought. Out of the people in the city he could rely on, there was one who wouldn't ask too many questions but would answer some, if he knew the answers, and if he got something in return. Thankfully, Svora's fine strands was not far from the harbor. After ducking across a few more streets, they stood at the entrance. Listen, he told, he said to the group, telling them in both Corvette and Oroa, they don't know I am a prince, so say nothing about it. They know me by Jovet. Call me that. If all goes well, we will be safe here. If all goes well, Luf rumbled with skepticism. Yes, if all goes well, Varen said testily. Be ready for anything, though, he added. The last few descrei had been nothing but unpleasant surprises for him, so it was best to be prepared for something troublesome to come up at any moment. He tried the door to find it locked. That was expected, given the uninhabited streets. So next, he knocked gently on the door. Geris, he said, keeping his voice low. Attracting guards over, over was the last thing he wanted. After a few more knocks, the door jerked open slightly. Dark, beady eyes peered out from behind. What are you thinking this at this time of night? Do you... By Jos, it's Jovet. Yes, it's me. Can you let us in? The eyes shifted around, glancing up and down the street. Then the door opened fully, allowing Vaden and his companions to pass. Gerdes stood a good deal taller than Vaden, competing with Luf for tallest man in the room. Vaden noticed some of his paunch was gone, his cheeks a little thinner. It's been a long time, Jovet, Gerdes boomed clapping a great hand on Vaden's shoulder. Far too long. Where have you been? Who are these folks? I've been away, Geris. Had some business in Gorande, then up in Detma. These are my friends. Vaden hesitated to place Luf anywhere near the category of friend, but he had a persona to maintain. Geris glanced around at everyone. Quite the friends, he commented. Look, Geris, I'm sorry to disturb you at this time of night, but we need some answers and shelter temporarily. I figured you could help us. Geris's demeanor veered from polite wariness to full-on discomfort. His eyes flicked to the door. 
These are not pleasant times, Jovet. I could get in trouble for harboring you. I'll make certain it will be it will be worth your while. We just need to get up on our feet. Coming back to Terran and seeing it like this was very disorienting. You know I'm your friend, but you can trust me, Geddes. I won't cause any trouble, and I'll reward you handsomely. Have I ever reneged on a prom promise before? Geddes stared at him, working his jaw. After a few tense moments, he tipped his head back and laughed, a sound that seemed to shake the walls. I'm just glad you're back. Of course I'll help. He turned serious but it had better be worth my while. You have my most solemn promise, Varen said with his most sincere, dazzling smile. For extra effect, he bowed and curled his fist to his head. Come here, you, Geras growled, and before Varen could do anything, he was wrapped up in a tight, smelly hug. You have strange friends, Ganeth said. Geddes let Vaden go at last, then greeted the others. When he discovered Luf and Saibov spoke little Corvette, he raised an eyebrow. As long as they like my banot, he said with a shrug, then motioned them all over to the bar. Your friend is very loud, Laird Anne told him quickly as they took seats. He is, but he's damn useful, Vaden replied. I like this man. I like this place. And... I most of all like Banat, Am um, said, grinning. Geddes deftly filled some flagons and set them with loud thuds in front of everyone. So, he said, leaning on the bar, what do you want to know? All right, so that was a chapter from the beginning of The Warriors of Brea, The Hidden Goddess. I hope you enjoyed, despite my occasional mistake or mispronunciation, as well as trying to kind of work through accents and voices that I haven't practiced a whole lot yet, so hopefully they're good to go. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think. I hope you're excited for the fourth book, which is coming out on Saturday, October 22nd, and enjoy the rest of your wonderful day.